long time ago, way back in the hills. Folks lived just about anywhere they could find or build. Well, there were some folks that moved into an old house that had an old barn behind it. And there was an old woman that everybody knew as Aunt Delphi. Everybody knew Aunt Delphi as that because nobody ever really knew where she was from, any of her kin or anything. It was just like she just showed up one day. Well, she lived in that old barn for a long time. And after that family moved in for a long time, it was peaceful. Beautiful. It just felt to home. Friends, family, neighbors alike would often come by and visit. Cause it was on the way to town. Beautiful area. But all that changed one snowy winter's night. They'd all nestled down getting ready for bed. When the old man went and gonna stoke up the fire and bank it so it'd stay warm all night. Well, he kept an old rocking chair, as most folks did, in front of the old fireplace. Said he walked outside and got him an armload of wood and a handful of kindling for the next morning. Said as he went back in, said there she sat in that rocking chair in an old faded black bonnet and a shawl. Just sitting there rocking. So he's top and dropped that wood everywhere. He said, Aunt Delphi, what are you doing here? So she never said a word. So she just turned and looked at him. Then turned back to look at the far. Rocks for a minute. And disappeared. Said oftentimes she'd stare through the windows at him. Especially the youngins. So if they's walking through past the winter, she'd just push her face up to the winter. If they'd scream, she'd vanish. Well, I reckon this went on for some time. And finally one day they noticed she hadn't been out for a spell. Well, as most folks did back in, they got to worrying about her. So somebody went up there to check on her. Only to find that she had passed. doctor said due to the cold weather it was really hard to tell exactly by how long she'd been gone well said that when they had her little old funeral said they weren't but about a handful of people showed up and then the same at her burial cause nobody knew who her kinfolk was well said the old man thought well maybe now I can finally get some peace he was mighty wrong. Said one day in the spring, he was out cutting a few logs to build him a smokehouse. And said he kept losing his axe. Said everywhere he turned, said every time he turned around, it'd be missing and be somewhere else. Said finally he got mad and started fussing about it. As soon as he did, said he started hearing a cackling above him. He said and he looked up and said sitting up there in a tree looking down at him was Aunt Delphi laughing. It scared him half to death. And again, she just vanished. Well, not long after that, his daughter was down at the creek. Washing clothes. See, when all of a sudden, all of her clothes in the water turned to crimson red. Well, she started screaming naturally. And said as soon as she did, 
She said a cackle fell across the water and slightly echoed through that little holler. Well, back in them old days, and oftentimes you'll see maybe some old pictures or something like that, and in some parts of Appalachia, it may still be going on. But a lot of folks would keep like an old picture and hold water and a little old bowl eye to keep, you know, use it to wash their face with. A lot of times they'd use it if they come in from the fields or something, they'd wash their face and hands or something before supper or before they went to bed or something like that. We we'll said one evening the old timer had come in from the field and his missus told him to wash up for supper. Well, he went in there and washed his face and his neck and washed his hands and his arms and stuff like that. And, well, he went and opened the back door up and turned around, grabbed that pan, going to throw the water out. So as soon as he did, so he threw the water and said as he was throwing the water out the back door, she appeared, and the water went right through her. So she didn't laugh that time. She just disappeared. I reckon that went on for some time after that. I reckon over time, as the years went by, the old house and the old barn was falling in, so they tore it down. And, you know, as places grow and things, they put a road by there. And right where the house and the barn was, it was a curve. Real sharp one, too, they say. But said a whole lot of folks didn't want to use that road. Said because when you got to Aunt Delphi's curve, said a lot of times she'd appear in the seat beside you and cackle. There's also many a report of folks saying that as they turned that curve or was in the cemetery where she was buried, said she'd also run out of the wood line running at your car, cackling and yanking on the door trying to get in. I reckon over time, that just faded too. A lot of folks thought maybe she was just mysterious or something like that, but they did say that when they went up there to check on her, and they went in there to find her, they said there was some sticks in there and tied in some really funny ways. She took an old piece of coal and drawed symbols and stuff on the wall. So there was old jars and stuff that they had no idea what on earth it was all over the place. So I'll leave that up to you. This old story here comes from a lady and her folks in West Virginia. And she remembered her great-grandmother telling it when she was little. Said that her daddy was a logger. And back in, he used old mules and horses and stuff to pull the logs out. Well, said one morning, he got up before the sun come up hitched his old horse up and went to work. He said he had a good distance to travel. That's why he left before sun up. He said he'd done it like, just like he had uh, hundreds of times before. Well, along the way, he said Dawn was just peeking over the ridge. His old horse started acting funny. So he thought, what in the world? Well, said, about that time, just up the road a piece, said he saw a man standing there. So he just standing there with his head down. 
He didn't know what was going on with him, so he didn't have a gun or nothing. Said all he had was an old pocket knife, so he rushed and grabbed it, you know, in case he was in trouble or something. Well, I said as he got a little closer, said he could just feel something weren't right. So as he got up a little closer, we could kind of make out what he would look like. So the man looked up, and half his head was gone. He said nothing gory or bloody or anything like that. Just like pieces of it had vanished. Or never did, never was able to materialize or something. And said he started to raise an arm and just vanished. And needless to say, he got his horse to run. And said he didn't even look back. He said having to go to work, said he thought about that for a long time after that every morning when he'd go off to work. But I reckon for the rest of his days, he never seen it again. Here's one that was recently shared with me, but all I can remember is that it was in Alabama in the 1930s. Said a couple had got married, had them young, and, well, I said they inherited a, an old house with some land from a distant relative. And said they was living in a little old beady shack, you know, which most folks did back in them days. Well, said when they got there, said a couple of the neighbors had seen them, you know, moving in, come to meet them and things like that. They told them, said that they had never met that relative that, that, you know, they got the house from. It was just passed to the next of kin. That's just how things was done back then. Well, said the neighbors told them, said he was the older feller, said, but nobody liked him. Said he was mean. Said he was meaner than a snake in the grass. Said couldn't nobody get along with that man, no matter how hard they tried. And said he'd start trouble with the slightest chance he got. And said even the neighbors told him, said, well, he passed on, but he still guards that house. I said, they told him, I said, well, what do you mean? I said, they told him, I said, oh, a lot of people would ride by on their horses or where a lot of folks walked back in them days. I said, they'd be walking by. I said, see him staring out the windows or passing the windows or something like that. But, I said, they didn't put too awful much into that kind of stuff, so they just kind of ignored it. Well, after a week or so, they started hearing things, little knocks and bangs, but just kind of shrugged it off as, you know, the wood popping or the house settling and stuff. And then late at night, when everybody was in bed, they started hearing heavy boots walking through the house. After a while, the wife and young believed it, but the husband still refused. He didn't believe it. He always had some kind of explanation. That is, till one night. He got him sauced. I mean, he got him some shine. I mean, I mean, he got gassed. And passed out in his chair. Well, the wife and the young one went off to bed. But was soon woke up by him screaming to the top of his lungs. She told that young and sat still and said he jumped up and she run out to find him laying there screaming, crying, and scared out of his wits. Said he wouldn't hardly say nothing or thing, but said she couldn't get out of his sight the rest of the night. Said he never did go back to sleep that night. Well, I said the next day he got got him up and started to pack. And started leaving to go back home. Well, finally, on the way back, she asked him what it was he saw. He said, they were right. She said, what do you mean? He said, they were right. He said, he was 
Said he was laying there asleep. He said he was woke up by footsteps coming at him. Said he opened his eyes to an old man with no eyeballs. Scraggly hair leaned over him about an inch from his face and whispered, Get out of my house. Here's an old story that happened in my family here in Middle Tennessee in an area called Cagle, out toward Dunlap, Tennessee, back in the 1970s. My grandparents had six kids, five daughters and a son. A long time ago, back when my mama was in her teens, all of them was living back at home and stuff. They lived in an old house. I always had a lot of ghostly activity. I mean, they still lived in it when I was born, when I was young, and I remember it very well. One of the biggest things that would happen was called the ghost car. Now, there's something known as a residual haunting. That's where something happens on like a certain date or something like that every year or every month or something, you know, on a certain date. It's almost like a record plan, like a fingerprint in time. It happens, but it ain't aware of you. Well, they say every now and then. Well, they say it would happen every now and then just at random times. So they hear a car pull in. So you hear the motor running, and then you hear it turn off. But no matter how hard you try, you wouldn't find it. He said many other people that would come by visiting, kin folks, friends, neighbors, they all heard it too a lot of times. Well, over time, it got to where it would pull in, and you could see headlights. So it would sit there a few seconds, cut the lights and the engine. As soon as the lights was off, it was gone. And after that, it would pull in. You could see, uh, you'd see the headlights and the outline of a car, but not quite enough to make out what kind it was. Now, my Aunt Jenny, the youngest daughter, once saw the outline of a man sitting inside of it. She said he was a big and two. Big old feller. Well, they seen that for years and years and years, even till after I was born. Then Grandpa, they kept seeing it when everybody moved out and stuff. But then eventually they found that my house was in a little better shape and they moved and possibly, you know, I've often thought, Lord, the way it was building up, what was we going to do when that car pulled up and he got out and come in. Even hearing him saying that, just recalling it, would raise hair all over me and turn my spine to ice. Another time, my mama had the same house and everybody was outside. Hot summer day. People Everybody's sitting outside under the shade trees and things like that. And said my uncle, he was, you know, in his late teens, said he had him a car he was working on. Him and my, my pa. Well, my mom says she'd come in to get something to drink. Back then, most folks didn't have air conditioning or nothing like that. They just had their doors open and windows open. Well, it says she heard something in the kitchen, and knowing everybody was outside, went to look, see what it was. Well, it says she was walking into the kitchen and stopped in shock. Because there on the table was this thing sitting there on the edge of the kitchen table playing with Pa's coffee cup. It said it looked kind of like a mix of a, a monkey and a cat. It said it sat 
straight up like somebody. It had hairy little hands and a long tail, says she thought. Well, it's some kind of monkey till it turned and looked at her. And she just got this feeling that, no, it weren't of this world. Said its eyes looked funny. Said it spotted her. Took off out the back door. It shot out the back door and instantly shot to the right. Well, said she took off as soon as it did. Said as soon as it turned, it vanished. But you also got to know, I remember this place very good. As soon as you went out that back door or the front door, either one, it was big open areas. It had a huge yard. It was surrounded by fields. A lot of folks over the years after I got up some age and got interested in Hanks and paranormal stuff like that, you know, a lot of folks that remembered that area, a lot of folks thinks that whole place was a portal. You know, back in the old days here in the Appalachia, they weren't a whole lot to do. Most folks had to just do what they could to entertain themselves. Play music or just get together and sit around jaw or something like that, you know, go visiting. Well, my grandpa said that back when he was a younger man, said that one thing they all like to do is go swimming. Well, so him and a bunch of his buddies got together once. A couple of his brothers, and they all went swimming. Now, back then, one of the ways folks made a living was mining. Folks worked in coal mines. Now, for some reason or another, God only really knows why, but, uh, well, they dug a big old pit. Well, well not far from where they lived was an old coal mining camp. That went out of business. But that coal mining camp had dug a big old pit. And it filled up with water. It was like a big old pond like. Well, I said they used to go down there and go swimming in it. Well, I said that one day they was in there swimming. I said, I don't know. He said it was just oh, I said they just all of us just kind of uneasy, like, you know, said just tension, you know. Said all of them kept looking over their shoulders and things, you know. Said oftentimes you kind of feel like you're being watched. Well, said they took their shirts off and their shoes and stuff and dove in. Well, after a few minutes and after a little bit of time, they... Tension started easing up, and they was having fun, things like that. And so they dragging, stacking up big old rocks and jumping off of it into the water and things like that, having a time. Well, one of them was able to open his eyes underwater. He said the water's fairly clear, you know. Well, I said that he took off and jumped in. That sad boy come back up white as a ghost. More said he was more like he was fighting and swimming to the edge. He said he got out of there and said he was kicking. They was have, trying to hold him down to find out what was going on. They thought of an old snake, an old water moccasin might have bit him or something. Uh, and said he, all he would do is just shake his head and point to the water. Well, my, well. My pa's oldest brother, they called him E.J. They said this old, they said this man weren't afraid of nothing. They said he weren't afraid of Hanks, or nothing. Well, they said he took off and jumped in. They were trying to talk him out of it because they didn't know what he was. We well, said he jumped in and went under the water. They said he'd come back and everything. 
told him, said, get your clothes. Get your clothes on now. We got to go. I said, what is it? He said, don't you worry about it. He said, just get your clothes on. Let's go. Well, I said, they all grabbed their clothes and stuff and everything and hightailed it out of there. Well, when they got back to the house, I said, they asked him, said, E.J., what in the world was it? What what'd you say? You know, see, so just, you just need to stay away from there, all of us. Said, we need to stay away from that place. Said, we don't need to go back no more. Well, said, one of them finally told him, said, if you don't tell us, we're going to go back right now. <coughs> you know, and see, he told him, said, all right, all right. Said, so he finally sat him down there and told him. And said, he told him, said, well, said, I dove in and swam down toward the bottom. He said, there's a man sitting down there looking up at me. Said, but he looked like he was half fish. And they just kind of looked at him, kind of like puzzled, confused. And said at first they thought that he was joshing them, said, you know, pulling their leg, you know. He said, no, mm mm. That's, that's, that's the Lord's honest truth. And the other boy with him, Ernest, told him, said, yeah, that's, that's exactly what I saw. And said, it, it weren't like he was trying to hurt them or nothing. Said, he was just sitting there. Said, it looked like a man. Shaped like a man, but it kind of looked like a fish. Had qu fish qualities to it too. And said it just sat there, and was watching them. And said when he swam down the first time, said it just looked at him and turned its head. Said he scared him half to death. Said he about let out his breath right there and inhaled underwater. It scared him so bad. Well, E.J. told him, said, yep, that's exactly what I saw. Said, same thing. Said, didn't turn his head, said, but he was just sitting there watching me. Said, didn't know what it was. Well, now, after that, I reckon they said there was a lot of other people went down there and went swimming and stuff. But now, as far as I know, nobody else seen it. But now, that don't necessarily mean... They didn't go down toward the bottom, neither. It's almost kind of spooky, though. Almost run a chill up your spine. Sit there and think about sitting there swimming and something like that sitting up there just watching you. Next time you go swimming in an old creek bed or an old river or something like that, Stop and think. Just what might be down there watching you. There was once an old witch woman that lived back in the hills. Folks say that she's well over a hundred years old. It was both feared and respected. Said she had an energy about her that nobody had ever felt before. <laughs> it weren't good nor bad, just different. Said she walked everywhere with two old dogs. Said wherever she was, there's always a mess of crows around a calling. Now, folks that had spoke to her said her name was Ivy May. They said she was known to just appear out of nowhere. Well, said one younger gal lived close by named Mary. But all the fellers wouldn't have nary a thing to do with her. Said they'd laugh at her and poke fun of her because she had a cleft lip. One day, a couple of gals was walking home from town saw Mary walking to her granny's. So they started laughing at her and making fun of her. And Mary started crying. I well, said out of nowhere, Ivy May stood behind Mary with an angered look. Said them two gals started to run. 
But Ivy May froze them in their tracks. Said Ivy May leaned down, rubbed Mary on the head, said, Don't you fret a bit, sweetheart. There'll never be nary another nasty thing past their lips. Said they took off running. Said that evening, one guy was kicked by an old mule, and the other one fell out of a wagon. Neither one of them was able to talk. Well, after some time had passed, they started getting made fun of, seeing what that was like. So they started being nice to people. Doing good things. We said as soon as they started doing that, their voice come back. And I reckon from then on out, they was good people. And as far as Mary, well, he says she woke up one morning with a normal lip. Said all the fellas around town was crazy about her. Said all of them went on about her, asking to take her to dances and shindigs and things like that. Said she wouldn't give them the time of day. Said she'd just flip her hair and keep on a walking. Reagan says she eventually wound up marrying a lawyer. Said time the time she'd pass her wifey me, Mary would always smile and wave. Said she'd always look at Mary with a grin and a wink. Now right here is one that comes out of Dole, Tennessee. Happened to my wife when she was growing up. She lost her father at a young age when she was in her teens. Well, after he sadly passed, things in the house started getting kind of crazy. Now, up to that point, they'd never heard anything as far as I know. But anyway, after he passed, every time she'd get up and walk to her bedroom door, There'd be something run down the hallway and slam into the door and swing it open like he was trying to hit her. It weren't too awful long after that when her and I met. I remember going over there and just getting out. I mean, just you just got just uneasy feelings. And it never failed. Every time she'd get up and start to walk to the door, you'd hear something run down that hallway and slam into that door. And then I remember hearing her mama say that not long after he passed, she was laying on the couch. So she's laying there and dozed off. So she woke up and said there was this big, bright light about as tall as a person, about as wide. And she said it was just a big old light. But what makes this old story real interesting? See, she used to like to get out and just wander around the yard and stuff like that. And one day she just went walking through the woods. Well, said as she got out of walking, said she come up on a little shed. Looked kind of like a little smokehouse or something like that. Said she walked up to it. Had a little door on it. Said she unhinged it, just kind of looked in, you know. Said when she did, there's all kinds of evil stuff in there. Said there was candles in there. A Bible that had been torn all to pieces and some pieces of it is burnt. That's that's evil stuff. Said there was old bones laying around. 
cup, it looked like it had blood in it or something like that. Said it scared her half to death. She said, and one thing that got her no attention, they said there was an old book laying there. And said it it was just old. Said leather bound. It had metal hinges like. And said she just got this feeling and just something said run. Where every fiber of her being just said run. So she did. Well, I said she run back home as hard as she could. Looking behind her still with that feeling of just something telling her run hard as you can. Said when she got inside the house that she felt a little better. Well, I said as she was walking by her house. Said she went around the corner. Walking past her bedroom window going to the front door. Said that book was in her window. Well, said her mama weren't home. Said she run over to the neighbors. Got them. Said they come over and went in with her. Said there weren't nobody in there. Said that both doors was locked. The windows are still locked. Everything was locked up. There weren't a soul in that house. And said they weren't no book neither. But I told her, I said, that's one thing I'm telling you. I said, you seeing that book was a warning telling you not to come back. Well, folks, I hope you'd enjoyed this. You can come back and see me sometime. It was mighty good to see you. If you want to hear more of these old Appalachian stories like this, or just reach right up here and touch that little box you see right there to see some more. There's old ghost stories that they call them Hanks back in, but or more witch stories or just some stories about just just the good old days. Well, I thank you for watching. I love you bunches. And God bless. <laughs>